Welcome everyone to episode number 13 of Toolhouse Rock. Today we are excited to be hosting Shreyas from Wama. A quick recap on Toolhouse Rock. Uh, this is a space where we host exciting projects in Web3 uh, with a particular focus on the endgame roadmap and their application to the forthcoming subdevs. A few disclaimers before we get started. Our views are our own and are not representative of Maker as a whole. Inaccuracies are possible. Information moves very quickly in the space. And especially if you're viewing this in the distant future, it's possible that things have changed. And finally, none of this is legal or financial advice. Okay, let's take a closer look at Llama before I hand it over to Shreyas. Analyzing Llama in relation to Endgame, uh, we think the most applicable scopes are ecosystem support, the accessibility scope, and finally, core resiliency. And looking at improvement categories, we believe Llama can bring the most uh, positive change to transparency, security, and finally, governance. All right, now I'm excited to pass it off to you, Shreyas. Thank you for joining us. Awesome. Uh, thanks for having me um, and definitely excited to be here. I think when I first um, uh, got really you know deeper into Ethereum and the Ethereum ecosystem, Mako was definitely one of the first projects that I found uh, interesting. Um, and you know, it was one of the first sort of uh, decentralized collectives that were on chain and that was quite inspiring to me and and you know one of well, one among other reasons that I got kind of more involved in in protocols and and DAO governance. So definitely excited to be here. Um, I can share my screen and get started. Um, and everyone, you know, definitely feel free to interrupt me when you have questions. All right, can everyone see the screen? Yep, we can see your screen right. sharing. Awesome. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about role-based governance um, and what we're what we're building at Llama. Um, one of the main uh, ideas is that uh, decentralization uh, should happen through access control um, rather than through tokens. And token voting and coin voting have an extremely important role to play in governance, but the way it's used um, uh, today is kind of as a super blunt instrument, um, but uh, you know, both token voting and multi-sigs can be used in a way more interesting way. And at Llama, we kind of lay out um, what that could be. Um, so taking a step back uh, to the evolution of on-chain governance, um, we, uh, you know, first a lot of teams and projects would use, uh, started off with actually just EOAs uh, to govern over uh, these key um, admin functions. So if you think of a protocol, generally it's just having a collection of public and private functions. The public functions can be called by anyone and the private functions have some type of privileged uh, access control where they can either be called by uh, an EOA that is controlled by an individual or a company, uh, a multi-sig that may be controlled by a company or maybe company plus like additional members uh, from a community. Um, or, you know, in, in recent years, a token voting DAO, where there's an on-chain governance process to actually, you know, call those private functions. Um, and it started off with uh, multi-sigs, where uh, Gnosis actually uh, built the uh, built a multi-sig for, the, uh, for their, uh, you know, ICO uh, process to actually sort funds and have a, uh, a, a safe way to transfer funds. And that is a primitive has become extremely useful and is used for all sorts of things um, now where it's not just, uh, you know, sort of a, a, a fund storage and transfer um, uh, system, but it's also a way to control access control functions and do a whole host of things, um, you know, deployments and other chains, 
uh, Aave's Guardian uh, is is done through a multi-sig where, you know, every time there's a, um, a deployment of the protocol in another chain or if there's a if, if there's a sort of cross-chain type upgrade and that happens through the Guardian multi-sig. Um, uh, and then the next evolution after multi-sigs has been uh, token voting uh, DAOs. And so these are, you know, um, the original DAO was was a token voting DAO uh, before it got hacked, uh, but also, you know, Maker, Aave, Compound, um, all token voting DAOs that, you know, it's it's pretty simple, uh, one token, one vote. Um, and, uh, and, and sort of, you know, one of the ways that, um, it, that got, then got effective, uh, and, and got used more was through delegation, um, with, you know, token voting plus you, you know, can actually investors could kind of delegate these tokens to, uh, other people in the community to, to actually, um, make decisions. And I think, um, I'll, I'll go through kind of what I think the benefits and, and, um, uh, drawbacks of each of these systems are. But role-based governance is, I think, the next evolution of um, this process, where it uses some of the elements of, of the um, you know previous systems. It really integrates well with those, but it kind of uses them in a way that they were supposed to be used, rather than um, how they're kind of being used today. So multi-sigs are easy to spin up. Uh, that's why they're used a lot. They uh, it's it's extremely straightforward. It's easy to kind of just have a three out of five, five out of nine multi-sig for most practical purposes. Uh, especially when you're early, it kind of makes sense. Um, but you see a lot of protocols, uh, not make it clearly, but a lot of protocols that um, kind of still use multi-sigs way, you know, along their uh, development process and, you know, after way after they have product market fit and and a lot of users. Um, and it's definitely one clearly centralized, but also it's inflexible. You can't have a 50 person multi-sig. Um, you know, it's quite cumbersome to manage. Uh, you can't have sort of custom approval strategies where, you want a three out of five approval for this decision, but a five out of nine approval for this other decision. Uh, but like a, you know, 25 out of 50 people to approve, you know, this decision that's like a much bigger threshold. And so I think the, um, uh, yeah, the the sort of thing that, um, you know, we really think about is how um, you can, uh, you know, use the multi-sig uh, really well, but also have uh, the, you um, limitations uh sort of addressed the next stage after the multi-sig it was uh, token voting DAOs, and and um they are a simple representation of a cap table and it's uh it's been effective because it kind of is a simple one token one board uh, but the problem is they're prone to 51 percent attacks um one of the weird thing with, with things with token voting DAOs is uh for them to kind of work you actually need um you almost need the DAO to be centralized in some way. Uh, you kind of need um, the investors and the founding team to control the majority of the token supply, which is what happens with most uh, DAOs and protocols today. Because if the investors and founders don't control the majority of the token supply, then it kind of becomes this uh, clear attack vector where if an actor uh, gains control over the DAO, um, you know, or they coordinate with other parties, they can really um, uh, control key decisions. They could, you know, uh, on cases, they could send the whole treasury to, to and, and collude to send the treasury to themselves. Um, it, this is has, hasn't has happened so far. And so people really underrate this uh, uh, threat, but it hasn't happened because DAOs are centralized. Um, and uh, because the ownership is centralized is what I mean, like uh, investors and founders control most of it. And it's relevant for Maker because, um, you know, as as the end game plan is playing out, like you know, you're you're seeing actually uh, news for, from you know VCs potentially like you know trimming or liquidating these uh, positions. Um, so Maker's ownership could be more uh, decentralized, which is really you know interesting and exciting. Uh, but it but the governance system isn't entirely built for um, you know a, a truly uh, decentralized sort of cap table. Um, uh, and I think the other problems, you know, that that uh, have emerged uh, are, you know, general apathy with token voting, um, uh, and and less context and decisions. And you know, investors have less context on sort of uh, decisions, like granular decisions and protocols, like how do you update liquidation thresholds or what do you do. And the way those problems are solved is, uh, you know, delegation, um, which is the apathy problem is solved when you have. Um, these specific people who spend a lot of time in these protocols, they kind of really assess. Uh, they, they follow up. The you know voter participation I think is increased due to delegation. Um, the uh, you know the the types of people involved I, I think is expanded. But one of the problems is um, 
Delegation leads to protocols really run by politicians um, because delegation is a popularity contest. And so people with a lot of, um, you know, uh, with a huge following on Twitter uh, or, you know, just have like the, the, the skills to kind of maneuver this super public uh, kind of adversarial system uh, get a lot of votes um, and people who can't navigate that system, but probably have a lot of skills, whether with planning protocol um, in risk management, um, may not kind of rise to the fold um, and you kind of have to navigate that system. And so multi-sigs and token voting uh, DAOs have really important roles, uh, but they can't be used as, as blunt instruments for every decision. And this is where I think role-based governance comes in, where you want to actually not decentralize just through tokens, but you want to decentralize through access control. And so what that means is outlining what uh, decisions need to be made. So what are the functions that need to be called uh, routinely or, or you know, in emergency cases? And uh, who should be the individuals, the groups, um, or the stakeholders, like token holders, uh, to, to make those decisions and outlining how exactly they should do that. So for example, um, for, a, uh, for, a, for a routine like um, uh, risk parameter upgrade, like uh, updating liquidation thresholds or, um, you know, uh, updating kind of some collateralization parameter. Uh, you want that to be done by, I, you know, a, a risk core unit, a risk sub DAO, a risk service provider. Um, and you want that person to be empowered to do it um, as frequently as, as it needs to be done. In some cases, maybe it needs to be done multiple times a week. Um, but you need maybe uh, a, a larger group. Uh, maybe it's the token holders or some some type of larger group of stakeholders to be able to veto or disapprove those decisions uh, if they're made uh, badly. Um, another example, uh, say like in an emergency case, uh, you want um, uh, on, on, on Aave to maybe uh, delist a certain asset. You don't want one uh, individual to be able to do that because that's a, that's a big decision. Um, but let's say you want to delist the asset as a sort of emergency case that needs to happen quickly. Um, you'd allow the risk service provider to say like initiate the action, but you need like a high enough quorum uh, or approval threshold from the rest of the DAO for it to go through. Um, and so the specifics, specifics of how these would work uh, depend on the protocol, but you actually start with access control as the base layer if, if you know, who uh, there are these like 10 functions to govern over. Um, what's the optimal way that individuals, groups, um, and, and token holders sort of govern over them and you kind of, decentralized from there and you permission each function rather than um, just sort of uh, token distribution is the, is the main way to do it. Um, so Llama is a on-chain governance and access control framework. A uh, little background on Llama, we've contributed to a lot of protocols like um, uh, Uniswap, Aave, Nouns, uh, um, and uh, you know, Lido and, and others. Uh, and uh, we, we were a delegate on Maker earlier. Like one of one of our learnings, uh, you know, from from all this is um, is about you know the limitations of of token voting and delegation, um, and especially as contributors, um, what's the optimal way to uh, kind of just get more done and more effective work done and prevent the protocol from being say uh, captured by a certain group of um, uh, you know politicians or, or people who are suboptimal for like the effective sort of functioning of the of the protocol. And so Lama is really the framework we wish we had. Um, and so we've kind of built it, um, you know, as contributors, you know, for productive contributions and and you know, um, people who want to actually just get get things done at these projects and and have the protocol uh, be decentralized and survive and thrive for for hundreds of years. Um, so the three things that Llama enables you to do, um, one is encode access control policies. So we actually issue uh, non transparent NFTs uh, to encode these access control policies, um, and they give you permissions for what you could do. Uh, these, um, these NFTs are non transparent so they're soul bound. But the cool thing is you can issue the NFTs to an individual, uh, you can issue them to a uh, multi-sig or to a token voting DAO. So that way you can actually have multiple stakeholders kind of participate in um, what the decision making should be. Uh, with Llama, you can create and execute actions. And so this is what we call uh, proposals, basically action in, in Llama. And so, uh, you know, anything from, um, uh, you know, transferring funds to updating protocol parameters, anything that can be represented on chain uh, is kind of what we um, help, you know, enable protocols to do. And lastly, uh, manage funds programmatically. So set rules for how you manage funds. You could, uh, you know, 
the routes could be automated or the other routes could be uh you know done through a specific human action where you actually said like you know if it's let's say below ten thousand dollars then um uh the funds can be approved with a much lower approval threshold um but if it's if it's a very large amount to be spent uh the funds need like you know a high approval threshold another thing that I think is is where that happens in in protocols and DAOs today is is all the funds sit in one big treasury. Um, instead, you know, we think there should there should be what one treasury where there's what serves as a vault that basically stores a lot of the funds, but you actually have multiple accounts uh, that um, that store like you know smaller amounts of money that are used uh, that can be unlocked for different operational uh, needs. And so um, you have a you know a sub account that has like much uh, lower uh, sort of permissions thresholds where specific individuals say like you know uh, risk service providers or others can uh, spend on on their relevant things but always the the main governance system can have an oversight over what the spending is done with and so I'll get into this later but I think it's quite relevant for uh, the maker sub DAO um, uh, structure in the end game plan where you can actually have these multiple sub DAO uh, sub DAOs operate within the maker governance system uh, maker governance can always have you know, this ultimate veto right over, you know, how these sub DAOs function, but all the routine stuff can happen at the sub DAO level um, where, you know, you can kind of encode these rules on a llama. Um, there's an easy way to kind of participate in these routine decisions and, you know, these sub accounts can be spent in a useful way. But if you say like transferring 100% of the treasury of the sub DAO treasury to yourself, like there's some way that the, you know, maker governance can kind of prevent that from happening. Um, yeah, so one simple way to think about Llama is it's a, it's a more powerful version of a, of a multi-sig. And so you can run a protocol through Llama with uh, 10 members or with, with 10,000. Um, and the way it scales is through um, uh, this access control system. And so um, you can uh, issue these policies maybe individually uh, to individuals. And so you just have, you replace your multi-sig with like, you know, 10 people that uh, have these policies and you can have, again, a custom approval strategy set up where you know, some things require a time lock of uh, three to five days. Some things can be approved instantaneously. Um, some things can be approved instantaneously, like an emergency, but it requires a really high approval threshold to be approved instantaneously. Um, and then, yeah, and then and then the last piece is you can permission each function. So you kind of don't need to have like a whole whole adoption of Llama, you know, permissioning every function. You can actually start off with just one function and then kind of, you know, go on from there where, um, if you want to, you know, start off with, uh, um, say, just seeing how to govern a, um, uh, like a, a whitelisting function on Llama to whitelist new um, uh, vendors or service providers that some protocols have, then you can start off with that before you decide to um, govern the pause function through Llama. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and, and the way, like, Llama's framework is, is, you know, an open source public good. And so uh, every protocol that, that uses Llama, it's it's sort of they're using their own instance of Llama. And so um they have, you know, of course, like full control ownership over exactly what they want to do with it with it. Um one of the key components of Llama is is uh what we call actions, which are just proposed transactions. And so uh these are you know updating protocol parameters, transferring funds from a treasury. Um and so in this example, you could just see you know, um, this is like a the action builder on, on Llama where you could see, um, you know, the the action is to update liquidation uh, uh, parameters and, and the liquidation threshold to 90%. Uh, you call this um, uh, this update risk parameter function on the make a main contract and you use like this voting strategy to get it done. Um, and it's, yeah, it's that simple and, and you kind of uh, submit the action from there. Um, we kind of want to take governance really uh, seriously. We found that a lot of times, um, uh, a lot of mistakes uh, are are made when people are are you know creating proposals and actions that uh, can be prevented. Uh, and we've seen as a, a lot of potential attack vectors of of governance. And so, you know, it'd be a gradual rollout of a, a lot of features. But we think um, it's very important to uh have the users and the and the action creators best interest in mind and you know making this an experience that um really uh helps them prevent like you know and any easy errors um so this is what kind of the the action page would would look like where you just have a list of um actions that have been created and so you know 
this is like the action to update uh, liquidation thresholds uh, through an optimistic strategy, which is, you know, the risk service provider can update it. And unless the, the rest of the DAO group vetoes it, it goes through. But there's also these other actions for transferring tokens. Um, this happens through an optimistic strategy. Updating the stability fee happens through, say, a standard voting strategy where the entire DAO should participate. Um, maybe this is like a larger token transfer. So it's like, uh, it, it's, it's an emergency strategy. Um, and so, yeah, you just have like these, you know, three components, which is what, what function, uh, you want to call, um, uh, the, the target contract and then what strategy you want to use. Um, this is, uh, just the, the sort of action state machine. It, 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 you could think of this as just like how an action goes from, um, uh, initial creation to then approval, uh, and execution. So once a, a, a creator calls the create action, uh, function, then an action is active. And then if the action is, um, uh, if, if the rules of the action are, are followed and, you know, the action actually is approved, then it gets approved. Uh, and finally it gets queued, uh, just like, you know, normal proposals work. Um, and then someone has to call the execute function and it gets executed. So that's like the happy case. Um, pretty similar again to, to, uh, how standard, uh, governance frameworks work. Um, but, uh, there's, yeah, there's a few additional things where, um, where right now, actually, at least with, with governor creators can't con uh, call the, you know, cancel action function, uh, which we think is quite important because there's a lot of cases where a creator, uh, creates a proposal, but then you realize that there's, there's an error or something has changed. Um, and the way they say it's done. Uh, for example, in Aave governance is you have to like, uh, remove your proposal power. That's kind of cumbersome to do. And so, yeah, I think it's an important feature to be able to, for the creator to be able to cancel, um, an action and, um, and yeah, and, and so, you know, action, actions can be canceled at various stages. So that's a good security thing where it can be canceled by the creator. It can also be canceled, you know, uh, by the creator when, when it's queued, uh, it can of course like fail if it doesn't pass like the, the normal approval threshold. And of course it could, you know not be um not be executed friendly um i'll stop here for any like brief questions and i could i could go on if there's nothing Chris, do you mind just walking through the emergency voting strategy uh real quick yeah sure um so i think a good way to think about it is yeah this is a um this is what a strategy involves. So there's these parameters that you need to set. Uh, so this is a, uh, this is a standard, um, you know, voting strategy. Again, like these, these names, you could, um, define it how you want, but, um, in, in this case, you, yeah, you just enter your approval period, number of days required to approve the proposal, uh, who can approve, uh, this, this action, uh, the number of approvals required, this can be a number or it can be a percentage. For example, if it's, you know, a token voting DAO with ten, tens of thousands of people, this could be a, a percentage and then force approval roles, which is like, who can, if, if this person, if this person with this role has, you know, has the role, they can approve it by default. Um, and so you want to be cautious with, with using that role. Um, and finally you have disapproval, which is, um, you have a period to, uh, disapprove. So you can set parameters for number of days to disapprove who could disapprove, you know, um, what, what's the disapproval threshold. And so an emergency strategy you can think of is as just the way I think about it is like, it's just a, a strategy that has, uh, it, it's a, it's, it's an important action that needs to be ex ex executed really quickly. Uh, so it's like fixing a bug or, or, you know, calling the pause function you want to do it quickly, but you want to have a high bar for it. Right. So you don't want anyone to be able to just call it anytime, uh, because then it can kind of be attacked and misused in some way. Um, but you want it to be done quickly so that, um, you know, if funds are drained, for example, you keep want to act on that. So, what an emergency strategy, you know, the way uh, you could set the parameters is you have a an approval period, let's say of three days, but it's um it's a variable approving period, approval period. So if it gets if you reach the approval threshold, it can get executed uh, uh, approved immediately, um, and you can have uh, a, a high uh, approval threshold. So you can have let's say like you know uh, thirty percent or 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 forty percent if of this uh, group of stakeholders need to approve it. Um, and if they do, then it gets approved immediately. And so, uh, yeah, we'll just think of an emergency strategy as like um, high approval threshold, uh, but uh, all near, you know, as close to instant approval as possible. 
Um, and this can apply to, you know, you can you can replicate a multisig with this, right? Like you can have something where, you know, like this is just 10 people. So it's kind of like a multisig. Um, and you have, um, you know, an emergency strategy here would be something like you need, say, like seven out of 10 people to approve this thing. Uh, but if they do, it gets ex executed um, immediately. But um, but yeah, for, for, for something else, you actually have like a three day time lock. Um, cool. Um, I'll run through um, policies. And yeah, again, feel free to interrupt me again if, if there are any questions. Um, so policies are just uh, these non-transparent NFTs that encode um, the permissions for and roles for, you know, who can uh, create actions, who can submit approvals, disapprovals. And once again, these policies, uh, they're really flexible. So they could be issued to individuals like, uh, you know, individual addresses. They can be issued to multi-sigs. They can be issued to, to contracts. Um, so token voting DAO contracts would, would fall under this. Um, so I think... You know the the very simple version of this is is you could just have, uh, you know, you you sign in with your wallet, uh, you know, you know, you you have the the policy to to you know you have the right to approve this action, and so if you approve this action, you know, the your approval goes through. Uh, if you don't have the right to do it, like it's still you know it's still going to be a public um, this the community will have public auditability of what's going on, uh, so they'll be able to see. Um, you know, exactly what action is being approved and disapproved, who has the roles to do it. So this, I think, is quite important even for early stage protocols, right? Because if you think of um, a lot of these early stage protocols, it does make sense for them to use uh, multi-sigs, but, um, but it's super hard as a protocol user community member uh, for me to know, like, you know, who actually uh, controls what in this, in this protocol? Um, uh, how, how does kind of this upgrade function work? Uh, in you know what cases can it be kind of misused and abused, and so you know with, with Llama we'll we'll have like you know a, a good audit trail of um, who has policies to control what, how these decisions get made, um, and if if there is you know if the protocol wishes to kind of you know slowly decentralize, then there is a way for the community to kind of get involved. So one way we've been you know talking to teams about is um, is kind of having a uh, uh, you know a way that a few um, members or stakeholders of, of a protocol can can uh, make some decisions, but there's a way that a community uh, can get involved in disapproving or vetoing those decisions if they uh, if they kind of don't align with with um, you know uh, what the what the protocol was you know said said it's going to do. Um, so this is uh, you know accounts. So accounts we we have kind of a native accounts feature that is. Uh, uh, again, you can think of just a contract that that it holds, uh, that stores funds. Um, you know, it's 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 non-custodial, so and it's completely you know owned and controlled by a protocol that um, uh, is you know deploying their their instance and and deploying their accounts. Um, and uh, accounts can be permissioned the same way you can permission the rest of your protocol. So the very cool thing with accounts is you can have uh, a specific individual. Uh, a group, uh, or, or again, like you know, token voting DAO contract that uh, that you know uh, has has the rights to to move funds from the account. And so, if you have like one main maker treasury, so let, let's say this is the main maker treasury, then you have um, a really standard or high approval threshold on this, where you need like you know the standard token holder approval to to move funds from here. But you actually have multiple sub accounts, and maybe these are like the maker sub DAOs. Uh, with the end game plan, and those sub DAOs just have like these um, individuals or groups who can you know make these um, sort of spending decisions themselves. Um, but maybe like you know the the maker DAO token holders have rights to some like broad things. For example, if there's like an extreme abuse, if you're moving like hundred percent of the treasury, there's some extreme abuse. There's a way for for token holders to kind of get involved. Um, so yeah, I spoke a little bit about this, but uh, I think the the cool thing with with Lama is um, you know maker governance can really outline the role of uh, token holders and sub DAOs, and uh, sub DAOs can kind of make uh, decisions and routine matters, and they can move quickly, and they don't kind of need this uh, uh, extreme you know cumbersome nature of of standard uh, token holder governance uh, to to you know do what they need to do. Uh, but uh, maker governance can always kind of veto on critical decisions and 
you can kind of define what that what that would be. And so, you know, potentially if if there's kind of a risk sub dot risk core unit uh, that has the rights to maybe call some functions, then you know you kind of outline the specific uh, types of ways those functions can be called. So for a lending protocol, you can outline that uh, the risk uh, you know sub DAO should have the right to uh, adjust liquidation thresholds between 70 to 80 percent but anything beyond that needs to you know be be approved by governance um or needs like needs to at least not be disapproved by governance and so you can kind of outline the, the rules you want and we, we you know work closely with with teams to kind of help configure these and so you know think through exactly what you need to do there's there's some initial configuration and 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 setup but you know after that it kind of will work on autopilot and you know you'll you you kind of you'll be able to clearly see um you know if you have this role this is what you do um and then yeah and then lastly like the the right to to approve and, and disapprove new um sub -dads. so you know make a governance can always uh you know you know choose sort of retain the right to do that and and sub -dads themselves can can choose to if, if they do want to disband in this sort of a, a process to do that um cool i'll I'll stop there. Um, and then yeah, just you know, uh happy to answer any questions or or dive deeper into like any any real aspects of Lama. Yeah, we have a couple of questions here in the chat. Uh first one is Lama only on mainnet or uh compatible with any EVM chain? Yeah, good question. We'll be on all EVM chains. So yeah, um, on, on mainnet and yeah, across every major EVM chain. And yeah, I think we already want, um, and we're seeing like this, this kind of use case much too with, um, some protocols have like a multi-sig deployed and like, you know, uh, 10 different chains and it's quite annoying actually to, uh, coordinate, uh, like, uh, actions across all these multi-sigs and it's like operationally heavy. And so we're actually building like a, a proof of concept to kind of for, for simple cross chain communication uh, across chains. Um, and so you can just have, you know, you have your, your protocol Zama instance deployed across different chains, but there's an easy way that if an action gets executed on a uh, mainnet or an optimism and you want it to be relayed through through other chains, um, there's an easy way to, to do that. And so, yeah, we'll, we're sort of, you know, working through the kinks of that too. We lost... Uh... Yeah, we lost uh, Ketra. He must be having connection issues. Um, yeah, no. I don't know if you want to go through the through the chat and see if there's. A... Yeah, yeah, I'm just looking through the chat now. Good questions. Okay, um, okay, perfect. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, in terms of um, make a governance contract. Yeah, like I. I described, but it, it works pretty much across anything. So again, we can issue a policy to, um, yeah, like, you know, uh, the, the make a governance contract, you can issue it to individuals, you can issue it to, to sub -dows. It really doesn't matter. Um, the question on, um, yeah, uh, can, can, like, do, does every sub -dow need to adopt Llama for it to be useful or just can like, you know, one or two do? Uh, definitely, I could. I I think one or two could could do it. Like incremental adoption is like what we're designed for. You don't we don't need like um, uh, we we don't need everyone everyone to adopt it for it to be useful. A good example is just um, yeah. Let's just say you start with uh something like um, you know uh, um uh, a sub DAO or yeah any any other service provider group that that does it, and all all it does is. Um, there's a way that, uh, you know, funds are transferred from, you know, make a DAO's treasury to the sub DAO's treasury. And, uh, uh, you know, most decisions are controlled by the sub DAO, but there's some, you know, critical decisions. Let's say if you're moving like, you know, over 70% of the funds or something, make a DAO's, uh, uh, token holders can, can have some, some sort of say in that. That's like one light way to do it. Um, of course, like the, the more interesting ways are if you, uh, if there are things that are exact protocol uh, functions that are being um, uh, adjusted. So if you're um, uh, updating risk parameters and it's a risk sub doing it and they have the right to do it within, again, a certain threshold, but if they exceed that threshold, then make a DAO uh, token holders are kind of involved in that. And so 
yeah, we're definitely designed for incremental adoption where uh, you could initially just have one group sort of test it out uh, and, and use it. And then if it makes sense, sort of, you know, more groups can come on board. Um, yeah, have, if, if there's any group that um, that is interested or even interested in like sort of exploring this, um, definitely let me know. We could like, we could basically demo like a, a test environment with with you guys and and just see what, what makes sense to design. Shreyas, how do you choose the name? Are you related at all to the other llamas in the space? Uh, how do we choose the name Llama? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, good question. Uh, <laughs> I like llamas. Um, I think, uh, yeah, like it, it, llamas have like a, you know, Rack Swagger and, and uh, the, um, it was, it's a simple name, two syllables. It's um, the, like the, I like the animal and like it, it kind of is, um, you know, it's, nice emoji space it's uh meme vitalik wore a llama t-shirt in like a unicorn llama t-shirt in in 2017 at this uh tech crunch conference and and i have that t-shirt too um yeah maybe one day like there's a there's a better story how like llamas are actually like you know the herd involved in governance <laughs> governance in DAO governance um so i don't have a great like revisionist history story but um that's a simple reason uh, and yeah, we, we said so Lama started two and a half to, you know, three ish years back. Um, and so there's a lot of, um, I, I mean, I, I know there's, there's a few other projects with, um, with that name too, but yeah, you know, we're, we started a while back and I think, um, you know, we're really happy with the name. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, and Shreyas, maybe you can comment on the, um, I know that some of the community was concerned by the interaction with Ave that happened lately in the in their forums I don't know if you want to comment on that or, or yeah just I think uh, I think it's a good example of like why we're building what we're building where um, we uh, like uh, sort of most token all the DAOs like they it, with delegation they kind of eventually lead to um, the DAOs really being um, run by politicians and, and really uh, sort of a, a aggressive, uh, uh, you know, politicians that do political things. And so it's it's sometimes hard for contributors or uh, service providers to kind of um, get things done. And it's partly what, what Lama is here to solve, um, where I think there's a lot of um, uh, work that uh, we had done that, uh, that, you know, was sort of, um, you know, factually misrepresented for, you know, different reasons. And I think, um, you know, where the DAO actually voted for, you know, us to uh, continue the rest of our work. Um, and so we're, you know, excited to kind of close that out in, in two months. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's one of the motivations, I think, of building Lama, where um, we always want, um, you know, everyone to have like a, a voice to express like um, when when things are wrong, but uh, to, to kind of default, like there's, you know, it's important for you know for us to build a system where the people who have a voice are not necessarily just um uh the ones who sort of gain um you know political power in a sudden popularity contest and so yeah uh that's you know partly a motivation for for building llama nice and um well, when you say the motivation do you think that i don't know if uh, if the if, if the point that you're trying to make is that if llama was more evolved in terms of product and Abe was fully using it, uh, this would have been prevented? And if so, how? Is that what you meant? Yeah, I think so. The previous work we've done with protocols have all been in the, uh, have been more service provider work. And so Llama is a governance framework. We've actually, um, uh, you know, we've not, uh, uh, like uh, Ave or others have, haven't used Llama as the governance framework, right? Like they have their own governance framework. And so, I mean, more that, um, we've done work as a contributor, as a service provider for different projects, and we've built Llama, the governance frame, and we've interacted with a lot of governance frameworks. So we've interacted with Governor Alpha, Bravo, Ave Governance, you know, Nouns Governance, and others, and uh, we've realized some of the limitations of of these governance systems, and and therefore, like you know, built Llama in, in kind of response to that. Um, and so, yeah, we're excited for teams to use it and and to, for us to get feedback on it. I think, um, uh, you know, it's always um, what we're 
we, we wrapped up our third security audit and we're uh, gonna you know deploy the framework soon um, and launch the application. So you know once we do, uh, if yeah if any of y'all are interested, definitely hit me up. I'm just hello Shreyas on on Twitter and Telegram. Um, and yeah, you know definitely excited to kind of get more more protocols to give feedback. Uh, I see a question. Um, yeah. Uh, so on um. On, on feedback on Llama and and kind of uh, just uh, how how potential protocols and customers will think about Llama. Um, I think the, uh, yeah, the feedback has been great, like very positive. So we, we've been speaking to, we're focused, one thing, you know, it's important to outline like the types of projects we want to focus on. And so we're focused on like um, our protocols. And so serious, like any smart contract applications that are, you know, quote unquote, like, serious uh, in the, in the sense that they're they're building something that um is built to last that has some serious security implications if you know the governance system fails um uh so not necessarily like the long tail of on chain organizations which some other like uh groups um that are building things in the governance space are building for uh that are quite useful and cool like they maybe serve like a long tail of of um applications and and DAOs. we're definitely building much more for uh the you know the um uh uniswaps and and eigenlayers and makers and uh optimisms and arbitrums of the world and so uh anything from you know infrastructure protocols to um you know other sort of application protocols and DeFi lending protocols and um yeah the feedback has been very positive because i think uh most times teams uh kind of struggle with uh uh, there's there's two spectrums where where they they either like use a uh you know earlier stage protocols they they use a multi sig some people carry on using multi sig right for for a while after product market fit, um and it's it's super cumbersome to um you know add a lot more people to the multi sig it's it's cumbersome to have a multi sig deployed across a lot of chains, it's it's cumbersome to um uh have like these custom approval strategies or or time locks involved with a multi sig. Um, so you know those are problems with that, and then on the other on the other hand, when you have sort of the the standard token voting DAO uh, with delegation system, uh, it's just like it's a hugely heavy lift to first like you know launch with the token voting DAO um, because first you have to launch a token. So with Llama, you actually you could choose to you know have a very lightweight governance system that then progressively decentralizes, but you need not think about your tokenomics and governance yet, and and your sort of token design yet because um you don't need to launch a token yet you can kind of you know decide to do that in a year or so but you don't have to do that now um but for one for the ones that already have a token it's still very useful because it's um you're kind of serving a um yeah kind of this uh this use case of the um uh of, of the you know the the, the sub DAOs or these orgs that you know the security council equivalent of um the uh you know, of, of what's there in Arbitrum or Optimism, where they have a group of like 10 to 15 people that are governing over this like pause emergency action. Um, it's also, um, it, yeah, and and you can kind of have like what we want to see more of. Uh, and it really doesn't like, we're here to like, you know, build a space. And so uh, it doesn't matter where it's coming from. But what what we want to see more of is, is a really good use of, um, uh, different uh, roles in governance in in a way that makes sense. So, you know, use token voting and and token holders to govern over things that make sense that they probably should govern over, right? Like they should probably they they, they are good at governing over, uh, say like a massive spending from the treasury or a um or like critical upgrades to the protocol. They're probably not good at governing over a routine like you know multiple times a week or multiple times a month like risk parameter update. Or, um, you know, the, a service provider, for example, should not have like a delegated power to then, you know, influence the approval of funds to either them or other service providers. We think that's bad design because it's like a weird incentive for a service provider to have delegated votes to then like, you know, approve either their spending or the spending of, of others. Um, so we just want like a, a system that uses all these components that have, you know, we're always building on the shoulders of giants and all these components have been built really well. Um, but they've kind of not um, been used to their full ability because you don't have this uh, delineation of, of roles that matter. Um, let me see. Uh, I thank you, True Name, for, for your compliment. And then um, 
can DAOs use um, these strategies with tools like Snapshot? Yeah, so Snapshot um, is, I think, a great tool for uh, temperature checks and and especially for, um, uh, you, you know, just like you have like say five options or, you know, even a few options and it's a good sense to get a poll of, of what the community wants. Um, we're focused much more on the, the, the finest series, final series, like sort of on-chain version of that. And we actually would like more actions to just come on chain directly. Um, in fact, I think, I think the DAOs that, that, um, uh, are interesting are the ones that bring like almost all the things on chain. Um, and so, um, if you see nouns, for example, they actually just like default are just on chain. They, they actually don't even discuss much in, on a forum. Um, they just like, you know, the proposal is on chain. There's like, you know, one day time delay. I think there's like several days to vote for the proposal, uh, but it's on chain and the discussions can happen everywhere on a discourse forum, on Discord and Twitter. But um, the action is kind of, you know, it, the on-chain proposal is the, uh, is almost like the, the source of truth that then leads to the discussion and the debate and stuff elsewhere. Uh, that, that, that is like, you know, definitely it'd be cool to see more of that. Um, of course it can't, doesn't apply to every type of decision and every type of, you know, protocol where some decisions are much more need much more like off-chain consensus building, uh, to get there. Um, but I think especially is like treasury spending type decisions, um, should just be, you know, brought on chain more. Well, um, yeah, I'm curious. I would love to learn more about um, uh, you guys too. Where you know, would love to learn if uh, like how the um, yeah, how things are making. I mean, I don't know if we're still recording, but like how things are making nowadays, and and just how the uh, how the NDM plan sort of vision is going, and you know what if there are any you know problems and 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 areas that need not be related to the governance of Lama, but just um, yeah, I would just love to know more about how you guys are thinking about things. <laughs> Annoyingly on chain is your favorite quote about maker governance. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I think we're all kind of living in the future to some degree, like, you know, at least a few years ahead or maybe five, 10 years ahead. And so, yeah, like, you know, we should try to bring more things on chain and, and uh, yeah, you know, there's going to be problems with it, but at least we kind of discover the, the solutions of, of bringing things accessibly on chain um, and how do we solve for that? Uh, some of it is some of the solutions lie in infrastructure stuff where on chain is expensive. And so we need to move to, to L2s and OLAPs. Um, some of it lies in just, uh, um, you know, maybe some UX stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I'm definitely excited for, um, you know, and like uh, governance is, um, uh, is, is just like a process for, for decision-making, um, that, you know, should be on chain and yeah, excited to see more of that. Um, and you know, it, it, like I've spoken about, um, these like more serious protocol applications, but there's also this like long tail of, um, of communities that I think are interesting where um, for them, I think governance is just like an extension of, of social networks uh, with like real decision-making ability. So if you think about say Constitution DAO, if they were, if they actually succeeded and, you know, uh, they, they were more truly on chain and they, they were, were able to kind of govern over the shared property, uh, that would be a really cool experiment in, you know, how you combine kind of social networks with real, Decision making power or uh, like ownership over something, um, and yeah, definitely excited to see see more of that too. Well, Shreyas, thank you for a great episode. And um, if you have any last thoughts that you'd like to share, and also, uh, where's the best place for people to reach out if they want to uh, learn more about Llama or get in touch? Yeah, uh, thank you for having me, Kesha, and, and thanks everyone for the great questions. Um, so I'm hello Shreyas on on Twitter and 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 Telegram. Uh, you could you could reach me on, on Twitter, and then uh, Lama is just at at Lama on Twitter. So yeah, um, we'll be 
yeah, we'll be um, sharing things more about uh, Lama. Would not been <clears throat> would not um, uh, publicly shared as as much in the recent months, but we'll we'll definitely do that, and would love to get more uh, feedback and and input from folks. And um, yeah, definitely let me know if if y'all have any questions or if there are even like interesting use cases for um, you know what to do with Lama. I'll also drop a link to the uh, to, to the docs. Um, so that you all can have a have a look at that. Um, but yeah, thanks everyone for joining. Thank you again, and thank you to everyone who joined us. Have a good day. See ya.